Hello everyone and welcome to the 8th lecture of the series on Fedic Red Book 2017. In today's lecture we will look at section 7 of the Red Book which is plants, materials and workmanship. We will look at a total of 8 clauses, clauses 7.1 through to clause 7.8 as usual in as much detail as we need to. Moving straight to the first clause then, the first clause is manner of execution. So clause 7.1 basically states that we as contractors are required to execute the work as per the contract in line with the contract requirements with proper scale, with proper care and the finished product must be in line with the specifications which are part of the contract. Any work which is not up to the mark and is not as specified and not to the engineer's expectations this work can be rejected and the cost of rectification of these works will be borne by us contractors a uh, simple example is for example we initially at the beginning of the project conduct a mock-up for concrete finishes we agree with the engineer that this is how the concrete finishes in the whole project will look like Moving on six months and we finish a concrete surface and this concrete surface does not match the finishes that were reflected in the mock-up originally. The engineer has every right to reject these works and these works will be rectified at our expense. Clause 7.2. Clause 7.2 is samples. Very, very important. What this clause states is that we as contractors are required to submit samples of materials to the engineer for approval before we actually go ahead and buy these material in bulk. The list of samples is normally part of our contract documents. We know what these samples are and before placing orders, bulk orders for these materials, we must procure samples first, show them to the engineer, get an approval from the engineer in writing and then proceed with the order. Like I said, yeah, no material should be bought before the engineer has accepted the sample. We as contractors often get carried away. We think that the wall paint that we have given as sample or the wall paint that we intend to procure is the best wall paint and the engineer will approve it. We go with this assumption and purchase this paint in bulk. What happens then is we purchase this paint and proceed with the painting of the walls. But then since the sample was not approved the engineer comes in and rejects this work says this shade is not what he wants etc etc and he is entitled to do that so as per the contract please ensure that we procure samples first get them approved and only then place the orders for the materials moving on to clause 7.3 clause 7.3 is inspection a very important clause what this clause states basically is that the employer and the engineers representatives have the right to inspect the site at all reasonable times these reasonable times are normally your working hours they have the right to inspect your site they have the right to inspect your storage areas they have the right to inspect the workers welfare facilities restrooms toilets etc etc in addition to that, we as contractors are normally, whenever we complete some major works, we should notify the engineer to come and inspect these works and get their sign off on these works in writing. If we carry out works without prior inspections, as stated in the contract, these works can also be rejected. For example, you are required to build masonry walls with block works, plaster and paint. As per the contract and the specifications, for instance, an inspection is required after you finish block works. But what you did was you finished the blocks and started the plaster immediately without notifying the engineer. The engineer may come and ask you to break down the plaster and redo it all. Very painful, I understand, but engineer has the right. So we as contractors should be very, very careful to notify the engineer and get the inspections done every step of the way. Uh, a similar example, for example, we are doing a false ceiling and there is HVAC works on top. Before the HVAC works were inspected by the engineer, we decided to go ahead and finish uh, constructing this false ceiling. The engineer has every right to ask us to dismantle this false ceiling, get the MEP clearance first and then proceed with the works. So this comes at a great, great cost to the contractors. As a result, we contractors should be very, very careful with this. Clause 7.4 is testing by the contractor. Simple but very important clause. What this clause 
basically states is that we are required as contractors to conduct all the tests that we are required to conduct as per the contract and as per the specifications. Unless specified otherwise, all the costs, all the arrangements for these tests are the responsibility of the contractor. If these tests are not conducted, the engineer may ask us to go back and do these tests, which will cause delay. If these tests fail, we will also have to redo it. So this is a very, very important step in the construction process. A simple example is, for example, we contractors construct a floor, a floor with tiles and we conduct a flatness test which fails, this will need to be rectified at our own cost and also the cost for the testing is our scope. Moving on to clause 7.5 then, clause 7.5 is defects and rejection. Again a very important clause basically states that the engineer has the right to reject our works that are defective and are not in line with the expectations of the contract agreement. It is our responsibility as contractors to ensure we comply with this request of the engineer immediately without any delays and replace or rectify all the rejected items and the costs for these will also be borne by us. A simple example is for instance we under the contract are required to supply galvanized cable trays but we as contractors decide to be a little smart and supply cable trays that are not galvanized. The engineer finds out, the engineer rejects this and we will have to replace these with the cable trays specified in the contract at our own cost. So the best procedure is to try to comply with the contract and the specifications in the first place. This does not go only for materials, this also goes for workmanship. You paint a wall, the, the wall paint is not in line with the contract and the engineer's expectations, the engineer can ask you to do it all over again. So let's make sure we as contractors comply with A, the material requirements as per the specification and also the um, workmanship is in line with what the contract demands. Clause 7.6 is remedial work. Also an extension to this clause, the contractor is required to remedy and rectify all these works that are identified by the engineer. If we delay addressing these requests from the engineer and delay the addressing of these defects, this will delay the project and all the consequences related to this delay will be our responsibility as contractors. For example, we have just built a wall and completed the wall plaster and upon inspection, the engineer realizes that there are cracks in the plaster. The engineer asks us to rectify these cracks before we proceed with the painting works. The rectification of these cracks will be done by us as contractors and should be done as soon as practically possible. Clause 7.7 .7, Ownership of Plant and Materials Very 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 important clause because this is sometimes a confusion on construction sites. What this clause says is that any material, any equipment, anything that is paid for by the employer becomes their own property regardless of if this material is on site, off site, anywhere. It is very important to know that the responsibility still lies with us contractors for safeguarding this plant, equipment, materials, etc, etc, even though this is technically the property of the employer. A common confusion sometimes arises. We discussed in clause 7.3 earlier that the site basically the employer has the right to inspect the site at any time. But we contractors, what we sometimes do is we are doing some mishaps on site or are trying to hide something and the employer wants to inspect the site and then we stop the employer saying, oh, this is not ready for your inspection yet. We cannot do that. The site is practically the property of the employer because he has paid for it. So let us get this out of our heads. We contractors are not as powerful as we think we are on sites. A simple example is, for example, we are meant to procure some material, uh, light bulbs, for example. We are supposed we have to supply 200 pieces of light bulbs and upon inspection, the engineer counts only 100. 100 light bulbs are missing, even though you purchase them, even though they were in your store, maybe they were stolen, maybe they were misplaced or whatever. In this case, since the light bulbs have not been seen by the engineer and not been handed over to the engineer, you will have to replace them at your own cost. 
and the engineer has the right to withhold a part of your payment until this is sorted. Clause 7.8 is the last clause of this lecture. Royalties. Very important clause once again. What it means is that we as contractors are responsible for all royalties, rents and duties and any other payments that are related to the materials that have been that are being used. These costs are deemed to be included in our contract price and are not reimbursable by the employer unless this is explicitly agreed elsewhere in the contract. The most common example is, for example, we are excavating materials and there is no space to store this excavated material on site. So we are required to take this excavated soil to some other location temporarily or permanently and that location charges us a fees. The contractor says, oh, I did not see this coming. I had assumed that I would excavate and store this material on site, but now I'm incurring these extra fees and the contractors try to make a claim for this. The engineer will immediately reject this under this clause 7.8. Another example is, for example, we are required to bring some road base to site. We go to a stone quarry and there is some fees for entering the quarry. We try to claim this. The engineer once again will reject this straight away under this clause. That being said, that brings us to the end of this lecture. We have completed section 7 now. The next section is commencement delays and suspension, which is one of my favorite sections of any contract. So I'm sure we will have some fun going through that in the next video. I will see you all then. Until then, happy building.